Hey, Hopewell, John Simmons, worship pastor. Glad to have you with us this morning, and we're going to be telling a story today of God's faithfulness, His healing power, and what He's done in the life of Donna Murphy. So I'm here with Donna and Greg this morning, and uh, we're going to be just kind of telling you their story and what God has done. So Donna and Greg, good to have you guys with us. Thanks. Thanks. All right, so Donna, really this thing started on September the 14th, is that correct? So kind of explain to us what happened on September the 14th. I don't remember. Really? Okay. Um, I don't remember making the phone calls that I needed to go to the hospital. Um, I really don't remember anything till October 2nd when I woke up in ICU at Emory. Wow. So from the September the 14th till October the 2nd. I have no memory. No memory. So Greg, you you remember the 14th I probably do. well. So what? What happened on September the 14th that kind of kicked this whole thing off? Well, I'd left to go run a few errands that morning and, uh, and the way, on the way back home. Uh, or when I got home, I seen some cars in the, in the yard and so forth. And uh, we have a doctor that lives nearby us and he, he came over there. And I came in, basically I came in the back door and he, he, he met me. He said, you need to go call 911. Donna was leaning over. I went in there and seen her, and she was leaning over, and she was turning blue wow. on her face and, and her lips. Wow. Uh, so I did, did that, and of course, paramedics got there in just a few minutes, and they got her uh, on the stretcher and got her in the uh, ambulance. They had to shock her before they left, so I was there about 15, 20 minutes at the house before they left. Um, went on, and before they got to the hospital, I was told they had to shock her again. Um, went on up to the ER at Northeast Georgia Medical Center, um, where they started working on Donna and uh, got her somewhat stabilized probably about five hours later. Sure, how much you want to say from here, but no, that's fine. Uh, that's fine. During that time, uh, they put what was called, they were calling it a boat impeller uh, type motor onto her heart uh, to make it pump. Uh, during that, for that time, she was going to the uh, I'm sorry, that was that next morning. Uh, actually, on, that was a Friday morning. They were taking her to the cath lab to, to do that procedure. So really, you'd experienced kind of heart failure in, yeah. in so many words, kind right. of, in but those now, few days. But now leading up to that, right. um, I had stomach issues, bloating, shortness of breath, which they thought it was all attributed to a fatty liver, mm -hmm. and I'd had an ultrasound done on that, so that's what they were treating for, mm -hmm. not knowing that what was happening was that my lungs and my heart were shutting down because of all the fluid around it. And I had even texted Catherine Smith um, the night that I was at Northeast Georgia, but I have no memory, and she said, Donna, you texted me. So it was that morning, it was a Friday that morning. morning. Okay. Yeah. No memory. Wow. All right. So, what I guess was after you got there? Of course, Greg, you may answer this. What was the original diagnosis? What What did the, What were they saying when you guys were at Northeast Georgia? Because then I know you got transferred to Emory. Right. But what were they saying when you were at Northeast Georgia? Was the original diagnosis? Well, they were. There's a Japanese word uh, for that, but it's called broken heart syndrome. Okay. Uh, which basically is from stress related stress to the heart. Right. Uh, and basically, like I said, heart failure. Uh, fluid kept filling up around her heart and lungs. They kept trying to clear that off. It would come, keep coming back. Right. Uh, 
I remember us getting a report here at the church that things looked like they were gonna they were kind of getting better when you were still in Gainesville. Is that right? Right. right. Things it looked like things were better, and then. Well, fr Friday morning, the, the nurse had called me about noontime. I was headed that way to the hospital. Uh, and she said, where, asked me where I was at. Donna had texted me, it was about 9.30 that morning. She, anyway, about, about noon, she, the nurse had called me and said, where am I at? And I said, so I'm on the way. She said, you need to get here as soon as you can. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is about two hour there window that things just started going downhill. Uh, like I so said, they were on the way to the cath lab uh, to put this, in, this to pump in. They were talking about this ECMO machine. I never had heard of that machine. Uh, basically, it's a uh, life support for your heart and lungs. It recirculates uh, your blood, puts oxygen into it. Uh, it was about five or six hour procedure was being done to to put these impellas in her heart. Mm -hmm. uh, in that time they were checking out for the ECMO machine in Northeast Georgia. Uh, they did not have one available here in Gainesville. Okay. And that's how we got to Emory. They, they had one available. So y'all were down to Emory by September the 15th? Right. That, okay. that night, Friday night. They Friday were, night. Uh, actually, they sent an ambulance up with two nurses and two doctors. It took about two hours to hook that machine up to her. Right. And they took her back to Emory. Okay. Um, so Donna, I guess there's really not any memory of any of that. The only memory that I have, and I don't know if it was here or if it was me having a glimpse of heaven, was that I saw people standing around me in a circle and I couldn't get up. First thing that I remember was on October 2nd, Greg was at the foot of the bed where I was at, and Bud Kirkland was with him. And I think, I didn't have the mask, I didn't have the oxygen mask on, did I? Did, well, they were taking it off during that time. Yes. And then that's where I remember. So from there on, let's kind of pick it up there, Donna. What what was it like from that point forward? That's kind of when the fight began, right? For you, is that is yeah. that kind of right? Yeah. Um, there was still a lot of feeling that had to come back. I could I could not lift my hands up. I mean, I could, you know, but um, my talk was not above a whisper. They were feeding me through my nose. And, um, you know, during that time, I kept getting better, but I was having to learn how to do things, everything, all over again. And um, we told them that, you know, I wanted to be back at Northeast Georgia because that's where my friends and family are. And we felt that um, in the process of getting better, this was where I needed to be. Mm -hmm. And so that was done probably what, about a week or so after that? Yeah, I don't remember the date. So it was probably close to maybe um, around the middle of October because they were having to get the paperwork and make sure that there was a room available. And once that happened, they had to make sure that my blood pressure was stabilized before they could transport me by ambulance to there. Um, and from then on, they um, went where they did not feed me through my nose. They actually put what they call a peg tube in my stomach. And my cardiologist said, oh yes, you're gonna have it done. But I was scared because my blood pressure wasn't where I thought it needed to be and she said no. We need to have this done. And from then, for seven weeks until last Wednesday, I carried around a peg tube, even though for four weeks prior to that, um, I had started eating solid food. They had done 
what they call a barium swallow test because my vocal cords had... They weren't closing up. They weren't closing up. Right. And they were afraid that I was going to get... What's it called? Um, get fluids or whatever back into her lungs. And, and have pneumonia. Yeah. So they had, um, during that time, I had gotten better here at Northeast Georgia. They transferred me to the inpatient rehab. And if I hadn't been stronger, because I was going to be three hours a day of physical therapy, physical, occupational, and speech. So they got me up there the day after I went up there was when we started working on building my strength back. So when you were in Atlanta, when you were at Emory, before you came back to Gainesville, there's really not a medical explanation as to why your heart began to beat again, is there? I mean, as far as what doctors said, because I know you know and our Hopewell family were praying through this whole thing for really months we've been praying right. for you. And a lot of you have been praying for the Murphys. And so I remember getting a report that your heart was like functioning at it was five to ten percent, to 10 percent. Right. and then there was like a 95 percent chance is that right greg that yeah. you weren't going to make it through this right. right so this wasn't just a this wasn't just a heart attack this was this was major this major wasn't a heart, attack. heart literally stopped beating stopped pumping and the machine was doing it for you and really we thought at one point oh my goodness this may not end well and people began to pray we had crusade during that time. We prayed for healing uh, through that week, especially, uh, I remember one night, Greg, you were here, uh, and we prayed for healing, and so we began praying for God to heal you. And one day, I remember, we got the report that your heart had started to beat again, yeah. and it had started to function properly again, and you were getting your strength back, and that's how this process of coming back to Gainesville began and, and and so then that all began to just you got more and more strength in the rehabs and everything and so now you're back home right. and doing the things that you want to do you're going on a mission trip this Friday we are heading back up to Rogersville yep. where we went last year um, when I got home on November 17th we went to my primary physician Dr. Gibbs following Wednesday, I think, and at that time, I was still weak, I mean, I was walking some, but still weak, and she wanted to see me in a month saying, I'm not sure if you can even make that four and a half hour drive up there, we're not sure, but in being there, all the tests she did, everything came back fine. Now, that following Monday, went to see Dr. Metapoli, which is my cardiologist. They did an EKG there and took my blood pressure, checked my heart, and she actually turned the computer around, which to this day it's steel, but she turned the computer around and she said, your EKG is perfectly normal. I mean, it's, wow. there was, and she said, if you've got a heart murmur, it's very faint. Mm -hmm. You don't have AFib, you're beating on a sinus rhythm, which is a normal heart rhythm. And I said, well, can I go on my mission trip? She said, yeah, I'll go. Wow. Now this was three weeks ago, yesterday, Monday. Yeah. That she told me that. Um, when we were in rehab, Greg was there with me when I was in physical therapy. And actually with the walker, I was able to stand for the first time in about six weeks. Yeah. And my head was so weak I could barely hold it up. But during that time, you know, they worked with me. Um, had some, you know, fantastic nurses and techs. Any chance we could, we shared how Christ had worked through us. And a lot of them were faith-believing people that they kept right along me. They loved coming into our room, you know, and, um, you know, it was good to see friends and family come and visit. I personally did not want to hear about the first 15 days because I can't imagine that. 
you know, I'm, I still can't imagine it, but I know when my heart went from five to 10 to around 55 to 60, Kent Barrett was there and the doctors didn't believe and Greg said only God. And that's what it's been. Um, the miracles that take place because of God did not just happen, you know, back when he was growing up. They happen now. And what this has been, you know, it's never been to blame God. Mm. To me it was, I didn't go to the doctor, didn't pay attention. Um, but the main thing was that even though I was trying to serve God here, and both Greg and I love being involved in our church, was that there had been unforgiveness, bitterness, grudges from years ago that had never been resolved. And when he woke me up, not only did he help me shed a lot of weight, but he took all that unforgiveness said, you know what, I brought you back to serve me now. You know, I've wiped this out of your heart. Now you can serve me the way you should. And I mean, that's where, you know, Greg and I have talked. <sighs> there's no unforgiveness, there's no bitterness, there's no, because, you know, I mean, how can God allow me to serve Him and witness for Him if I've got these feelings that are unresolved because, you know, there's there's a blockage there. And I think that's what He did. I think He took the fluid. He took the blockage. He took all of that. You know, my voice may never be what it used to be. But our testimony, you know, you can share Christ without saying a word. Greg went through, and what so many people went through, I am truly sorry, uh, but the doors that it has opened, today when churches are closing, you know, and people think that, you know, something bad happened to you, why aren't you blaming him? He was there, thank you God that he was there, yeah. and it's made our relationship stronger. Um, I've had to depend on him more where before I was very independent and, and what. And uh, uh, you know, to hear the doctors here say what they've said, I'm still astonished. Mm -hmm. Because you keep on wanting to see, well, there's got to be a flaw in this, something. It's got to be, and they're like, no, even today, you know, Dr. Gibbs wanted to hug my neck. She said, you know, I've known a couple of others, and she said, you know, you're going to work on getting your heart stronger, and, you know, it's, it's coming slowly. You know, they don't want me to fall, but the determination I don't think God wanted me to sit still. I think He wants me to fight for who He is. Not just to get my strength back, but to encourage others that, you know, even in the bleakest of circumstances, it's there. Oh my goodness. Man, it's been amazing. Well, one thing that I would just ask is, you know, again, a lot of, a lot of our church family here and folks all over, story and have been praying for you through this time. So what would each of you, if you just had an opportunity to say to your Hopewell family anything and to the folks who pray for you, um, what, what would you say to them? What would your encouragement be to those folks who have watched the miracle that God's done in your life? What would you say to those folks today? I say first things, which we yeah. have. Right. Uh, thanks for them to do it for from the first day, yeah. Uh, from I won't mention his name, but 
from the person who took me to the yard to the Ben Emory that night. Uh, we have a great Sunday school teacher, by the way. They, they went, again, they went on their anniversary. He was, they were taking me to Emory. They said in that, then they were with me about one o'clock in the morning uh, that night. The first night she was, she was there. Uh, just from things that, the little things people have done, I can't say enough things. inside and outside the church uh, as they did at our house and just it, it, it's really it's really humbling uh, not that I didn't know that we had those folks here but but to know that as I told some it, it's very hard to take that to Because we've, we've been kind of, we've been those those givers, and it's, and it's hard to receive mm. uh, that as well. So saying that, uh, again, only, only God could could cause that, mm. could, could make that happen. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I'm not sure how to. I mean, it's, it's kind of unexplainable, I guess, sure. in, that, in that sense. Uh, Donna. God didn't let me down. Um, he put me at a church where it's a prayer-based church. When you walk in, you feel loved. You feel welcomed. Um, the church here isn't for the people that have it all together. You know, I came here brokenhearted. No, she was in, no. She was in a coma. No, I didn't know anything about it. Yeah. Um, but I was there. It's to me. I don't think I'm the miracle. I think who God is. He's our miracle. I'm just a vessel that He said, you know what? I'm not through with you yet. But all these people that prayed, they weren't praying to a man that was dead. They prayed to a living man. One that we celebrate as a baby in a manger in Bethlehem. And 33 years later, he was beaten and he bled for us. I mean, how do you engulf all this? You know, I mean, I'm just Donna. I love the food pantry. You know, um, I love being a part of a lot of the ministries here. Well, he didn't let God down because he knew when we became members of this church seven years ago in January, he knew every step we were going to take and the people that it was going to affect. Why he let it happen to me, I think it's to show the Hopewell family that, you know what? your prayers and he's still hearing them because through God's grace this trip that we have been planning for a year we're gonna be able to go and witness to others and you know through the article that was done it wasn't about us it was about how mighty our God is how mighty when you come down to the altar when you raise your hands when you sing in the choir when we have that he lives and God saves, oh yeah, you know, it's, it should encourage everybody to go out and bring people in. Don't look at me as, you know, she's a walking miracle. Look at God as he's a walking healer. And 
and that's what he's about, and he's still doing it, you know, and, you know, I couldn't wait to get home and get back to church. So, you know, for us, you know, in our walk, it's gotten stronger, and has he healed me? Because it keeps, you know, the doctors are, you know, everywhere we go. Um, I keep getting stronger. Uh, we went back to inpatient rehab last week, you know, and, you know. Same folks there and they didn't recognize me. They didn't recognize me. Wow. They didn't recognize me. That's awesome. So it's, um, you know, the Hopewell family, they're our blood family too. You know, it's, Greg has gotten to know a lot of people. I've gotten to know a lot more people. And we've seen, not just in what it's done to me, but what it's done to others, just how powerful God is. You know, and the baby that, you know, was born in a manger, there to touch every one of us. If we just let him. Um, I didn't wake up with bitterness. Never woke up blaming him. I was just thankful that the forgiveness had taken place. Now he could use me. Before, I thought he was. But he had to get beyond those barriers. So, now, let's go out and encourage who our Savior is, and no matter, you know, what we go through, He never left my side, even when I was back at Emory, when something had come up and they were having to make a decision to take me off, because of His amazing grace, the next day, my heart went like a car going zero to 60. Yeah. And, literally. you know, literally. And it's still getting stronger. Wow. Isaiah yeah. says that he was crushed. He was bruised for our transgressions. He was crushed for our sins. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his wounds. really appreciate you guys sharing your story with us as a church family and I know it's going to encourage some folks and uh, we want to just give God all the glory for it all and thank you for your obedience um, tell the story of what our great God has done and thank you Hopewell pray for just continue to pray for Donna because you still have still have some ways to go and we're praying for you guys y'all have a mission trip like we said coming up this Friday going to Rogersville I'm going to be sharing your story there right. actually with the folks in Rogersville at that mission that uh, they're going to be serving at. So it's just been great to have you guys with us, and we're praying for you and sure appreciate you.